just when you think you're gonna die of suffocation, ow! Oh, you get a sharp pain in your knees, which begins to work its way right up to... I think we got the picture. Do we? I think Neelix was gonna say gut, but you made an assumption, and now he's pointing somewhere rather suggestive. I'd find the second best source acceptable if it tasted better. <laughs> you humans! <laughs> You're not used to roughing it, are you? This is one of the plot lines I think would have made Voyager all the better. I think people forget that at the time when Voyager came out, networks were hesitant to do a series where missing an episode could leave you confused about what was going on. So each week saw Voyager return to its perfect, pristine condition. I would have loved it if Season 1 featured a Voyager limping along, desperate for supplies, low on energy, and in a state of disrepair. But the powers that be decided to play it safe and kept it as traditional as possible to other Trek shows, just in a different part of space. The point of this long-winded tirade is I like moments like these that remember Voyager is low on rations. What is it? A Leola root. I don't know why, but I've always enjoyed the Leola root running joke. It's a joke that endures all seven seasons, and each time it comes up, it just makes me smile. What do you see, Mr. Paris? It's like a reflection, something in low orbit when it moves into a certain angle from the sun. It actually makes sense that Tom would be the one to see this. Sure, Tuvok would be on the lookout for things from a security perspective, but Tom would be on the lookout for things in a, if I hit something, we're all going to die kind of perspective. It's not a cloaking device as we know it, Captain. I cannot say for certain what it is, but the ship does employ some kind of masking circuitry that has affected our sensors. I really love episodes like this. Once we get the reveal, all the discrepancies fall neatly into place. Too many mystery episodes only work by hiding a key piece of the evidence from you that the characters found out so that you can get a big whammy when the camera shows you what they saw to figure it out half an hour ago. This episode throws all the clues out there for you to be mulling over along with the characters, and it's awesome. Collect your teams and prepare to transport back while we investigate. Acknowledged. Chakotay out. Of all the futuristic pieces of technology that exist in Star Trek, it's the humble comm badge I want to know more about. As something we might reasonably be able to create today, I want some hard and firm rules about its functioning. Does it automatically hang up by saying out or over? Can you activate by saying, okay, Badgie? I need to know these things. Kazan. Being able to identify a craft by its shadow is actually a real thing. In World War II, the public was actively encouraged to recognize the country a plane came from just by seeing its shape in the sky. The only odd thing is, this is the first time Voyager has ever encountered the Kazon Nistrum. I can only assume that Neelix provided them with this information off-screen at some point in the past four months. So, how did the Kazon actually get here without Voyager noticing them? I know that we find out they had an inside man, so to speak, but they don't have transporters, right? So how do they get people down there without Voyager noticing? I get out of here. Phasers are another piece of technology I wish we saw more consistency on. Sometimes a shoulder hit is glancing. Sometimes it doesn't matter where the phaser hit. It's instant death. I know we see that the Starfleet issue phasers have mini settings, but phasers seem to only cause as much damage as is dramatically poignant at that moment, and it's always annoyed me. Neelix, our devoted morale officer, responded to the call and came in to cheer them up. And while they were all singing Rakan folk songs, <laughs> Jackson and I broke into the kitchen. This is a great scene. Combined with the interaction with Seska and Balana in the previous episode, it highlights how at least Chakotay and Balana have been infected with the Starfleet ideology. I love how Chakotay assumes she got it made legitimately right up until the last moment. Does he know about this yet? Well, the morale crisis ended a few minutes ago, so I'd say... He to Chakotay. ...that he probably does. Okay, yeah, one might argue that the timing of all that is too perfect, but it made for a funny moment, so shush. Also, I love how during this whole thing, Seska doesn't even care. Even though it's obvious Chakotay is upset and Neelix is reporting it, she keeps eating the soup and laughing about the situation. You put me in the brig? After all we've been through? I think it's kind of sad that Seska makes for a better femme fatale than Liddell, a character who was literally created only to be a femme fatale. I get the point. Can we make up now? On the downside of this episode, the relationship between Seska and Chakotay feels unearned. 
You can't plan everything, and everything has to start somewhere, but if you're going to have a pre-existing relationship between two characters, you'd think that at some point in the past 10 episodes, it would have at least been mentioned or hinted at. Captain, this may be a trap. The Kazon Nistrum is one of the most violent sects in the entire Kazon Collective. I want to see more of this plotline. It sounds like an awesome concept where different sects responded to Voyager more amicably. Sadly, this one line is really all we get to see of this concept. Mr. Paris, run an extended scanner sequence to identify any other Kazon ships that might be in the area. Nothing showing up, Captain. But you just discovered the Kazon can do some kind of cloak against your sensors just an hour or so ago. Wouldn't you be a little more careful after that? But if we can help, we should. Besides, this may be an opportunity to make a friend. And out here, we can use all the friends we can get. This is such a Starfleet mentality. I miss this kind of uplifting message in Star Trek. Also, I love that look she gives Chakotay at the end. Like, of course we'd have one less enemy if it hadn't been for Neelix opening fire on the Kazon as soon as we met them. When I first saw this, I thought for sure we were going to have a cloaking technology in the same line as what we saw in the TNG episode, The Pegasus. I'm not sure if it makes sense for it just to have been caused by a replicator. It is likely that the ship's automatic containment systems were activated when the radiation entered the bridge. We should be safe as long as we stay on this side of the force field. You know, sometimes you just get the framing of a shot wrong. It's stupid to have Tuvok talk about staying on this side of the force field and then immediately show someone in a position that looks like they're on the opposite side of the force field. The residue has a 0.41% trace of a Neosaurium composite. And I don't know anyone who uses Neosaurium technology except for the Federation. Okay, first of all, it makes no sense for only one political power to use any given piece of technology in Star Trek. Why wouldn't some independent transport captain upgrade her ship to use a black hole like the Romulans? And B, you're 70,000 light years from anyone you know, Bellana. Maybe there are quite a few races that use that technology in the Delta Quadrant. Bellana's right, of course, though. Two, another Federation starship may have been brought to the Delta Quadrant prior to our arrival, and they interacted with the Kazon Nistrum. This line makes me wish they had known from the beginning that they were going to have a second Federation ship out here and included little moments like this every now and then to indicate that maybe they weren't alone. Three, someone from this ship has covertly given technology to the Kazon. Four, the Kazon were able to scavenge some parts from the Marquis ship. Five, Q is messing with you. Six, the Kazon developed it after scanning Voyager. There, I just doubled the possibilities for you, Tuvok. There are a lot of possibilities for why this technology is out here. <laughs> Tuvok's right, of course, though. Releasing the force field isn't an option. That would just allow the radiation into the whole cabin. Be honest. Do you know someone who walks through a group of people just to start a conversation with one person? We could use an expander to manipulate the containment field. Rotate the field and the radiation trapped inside it away from the console. Once it's clear, we have access. I'm not sure if an expander would manipulate the field out this way. I feel like there might be a better descriptor for a device that moves things other than expander. Still, this is a clever idea that feels like it would work instead of just being a techno babble word salad. And I like that. I want it ready by the end of the day. No, Captain. When I say tomorrow, I mean tomorrow. I don't exaggerate. Tomorrow is the best I can do. Understood, Lieutenant. This episode is full of great moments, such as a slight nod toward things always taking less time than predicted in Trek. Blana sticking up for engineers. Janeway's not of respect despite being called out in front of crew members because she's confident in her position. And trust Blana despite what happened in the last episode. And this smile Chakotay has because he's happy to see Blana being a good engineer and Janeway trusting her. This is great stuff. There's nothing important to do on the bridge. I disagree. We need someone up there. What the hell is going on? There's some concern about you. Look, I get that love can make people blind, and Chakotay is 100% convinced there's no way Seska could be guilty, but this is a boneheaded move. He's the second in command and should know better than to tell someone actively under suspicion that they are actively under suspicion. Oh, I see. So now I'm a traitor. I sell technology to the enemy. I don't believe that. Wow! Seska could teach a master class in gaslighting. Will he regain consciousness? I'm not sure. 
Even if he does, there's no way to predict what kind of brain damage there might be. The Federation might actually be a dystopian dictatorship. Taking off your badge, a device that constantly tracks you, remember, is always associated with treason, and doctor-patient confidentiality seems to be a completely foreign concept. Did you ever come in to leave a blood sample on file? No. I had a childhood disease that infected it. I was warned never to donate blood for a transfusion. All the more reason we should have your blood on file. Right now I have something more important to take care of. Giving blood is a two-second affair in Star Trek. As the chief medical officer, there is no reason for the doctor not to insist on a hypospray donation this instant. Captain, I'm showing an unauthorized auto sequence in transporter room two. Someone's left Voyager. One could argue that it would be odd to lock down all communications on and off the ship. Though on a military vessel, I would expect it to be the default state. But the ability to freely use transporters? That seems like something that would have to be unlocked prior to their use. I didn't mention this the last time we saw these armbands and time and again, but I could have sworn we have seen these in TNG. Turns out I was wrong. The armbands I was thinking of in Best of Both Worlds and Timescapes are significantly different, so I can't win them all. Captain, it is conceivable that she's gone to the Kazon ship to destroy evidence that might implicate her. She's gone back to the Kazon ship to prove herself to us, can't you see that? I wish I could see this episode fresh for the first time again. I don't remember if I thought the foreshadowing was a little heavy-handed at this point, or if they were setting up a bait-and-switch. Watching it for the upteenth time, I'd say it's a little heavy-handed in this scene. I would have liked it better if someone else did this and Seska sabotaged their subspace armband thing to keep the mystery going. I've got a lock on her, Captain. Do you want me to transport her back? What do you mean you have a transporter lock? Earlier in the episode, we were told... We can't transport it out. Not with those levels of nucleonic radiation. If you're going to make up hurdles, then you have to stick to it. How have things been going for you in engineering? Fine. Why, is there a problem? Problem? No! No. I'm sure people routinely get called in to have a no-problem chat with the captain, the first officer, and the chief of security. Oh, come on, Carrie, Get your mind in the game. But you know how it is down there during a systems analysis. Did you see anyone else at your station? Honestly, I don't remember. This is actually a significant security problem that is almost impossible to solve. Your weakest security points are inevitably the everyday people you hire. What do you think? He had the motive and the opportunity. He's also had a distinguished Starfleet career. Ignoring the fact that Janeway is right about Carrie, this is bad logic. Crimes are often committed by people who all his friends and families and neighbors would say couldn't have possibly committed the crime they were caught red-handed on camera doing because they are such a nice guy. My name is Kala, first Marge of the Kazon Nistrum. What have you done to our ship? This is the first appearance of Kola, the first Maj of the Kazon Nistrum sect, and apparently they weren't entirely prepared for him. The makeup crew hadn't done any Kazon since the first episode, so most of the prosthetics didn't quite fit right. I can't tell though. Also, I had no idea about this, but to make the Kazon, they actually started with a Klingon forehead prop. How cool is that? This is another one of those minor nitpicks. But the timing of the scene doesn't quite work as the shot lingers just a moment too long to give us a chance to work out what's happening. Also, the sound department messed up by not having a good sounding thud. I'll fix that for them so you can see what I mean. Mm, much better. You're asking me to believe she's a Cardassian agent who infiltrated the Maquis? Starfleet security has documented several incidents in which Cardassians have used cosmetic alterations for the purpose of infiltrating an enemy. Yeah! This has happened several times in DS9. The most notable is going to be Goldicott, but at this point in its run, we've at least seen Kara being kidnapped and surgically altered for the purpose of exposing an enemy. The doctor has informed us that there's no other plausible explanation for the medical anomalies, Commander. Actually, how were they not able to use their sensors and figure this out earlier? Back when disguising yourself as a member of an alien race was first introduced, it was presented as a cosmetic alteration. But now it's acting like you can change your literal DNA to trick scanners as long as no one looks too closely at your blood. I suggest we wait until we retrieve the console. Janeway to Taurus. Yes, Captain. <laughs> Janeway says suggest, but then immediately does what she wants. I think she meant to say we will do it after we retrieve the console. You were working for her. Sesco was working for them. Was anyone on board that ship working for me? I would have loved it if later we found out that Blana was an agent of the High Command. Janeway to away team. Yes, Captain. I don't want to rush you, Lieutenant, but... We're finished, Captain. I beg your pardon? 
<laughs> this line cracks me up every time. It's amazing how well things go when you do it the right way. Of all the things to die for, it's a food replicator. I've watched and rewatched this episode a lot. And I still don't know how I feel about the reveal of it being a food replicator. On the one hand, yeah, it's a great subversion, where the thing that caused the damage was ultimately something so mundane. But on the other hand, that means any replicator without the proper shielding is a, uh, a, a kitten waiting to go off. It's a replicator, constructed with materials from Voyager. I suppose now everyone thinks I went over there to destroy the evidence. Look. If there's someone gaslighting you in real life, get out of that relationship. If you're with someone who never apologizes when they do something wrong, and always turn the conversation onto your faults or try to blame you for being upset because they did something wrong, that's a toxic relationship and you just don't need in your life. You are worth more than that. I'm not sure of a lot of things. Well, why don't you go talk to your animal guide and figure it all out? That's racist, Seska. I really love how Seska keeps coming back and ends up being a real Lady Macbeth kind of character. But I think it would have been great if after all this it had been someone else and all the evidence against her had been mere coincidences. That, or they had done more with Carrie, so he had an equal number of coincidences stacking up against him. Isn't that why you never got around to a blood analysis when we came on board? I didn't get around to it because I didn't get around to it. Turns out your blood is missing all the common Bajoran blood factors. Also, the comments about the blood markers makes my personal canon say that the Cardassians and Bajorans were originally one race. They've always been so closely intertwined, it would make sense that some Pa Wraith took the original Cardassians to a nearby planet where their culture and development diverged. Is there any reason to be sticking around at this point? They have the part off the ship. They're conducting their own internal investigations. Seems like it's the right time to get out of Dodge. Anybody know who security code that belongs to? I do. It's Seska's. Cards on the table. I know that I could not write a TV episode no matter how much time I was given, let alone as quickly as Trek writers sometimes had to. Not to mention keep the story coherent with all the changes that were often forced on the writers. But this moment represents a moment where they were so close to getting it done right. There just wasn't enough screen time to finish fleshing out Seska's character and leave enough breadcrumbs to keep you guessing as to who the guilty party was. They do a better job of this in season two though. Computer, activate emergency holographic medical program. Ah. I think this is the first time the doctor is activated without saying, please state the nature of the medical emergency. It's never really addressed as to why he doesn't say this one time, but I think the answer is, is because he wasn't actually deactivated for the scene. His program was running in the background, so it didn't have to go through the startup routines when he was made visible again. I did it for this crew. We are alone here, at the mercy of any number of hostile aliens, because of the incomprehensible decision of a Federation captain. Seska has a point. This is another plotline that would have been interesting to follow, where Seska was misguided but genuinely cared for the people of the crew. Unfortunately, she quickly devolves into a mustache twirling villainess. Computer, command XJL. Computer, override transport in progress. Unable to comply. Security lockout is in place. No, no, please. No one tried to do anything to stop her as she gives a lengthy verbal command to escape. I'd hate to be a bother. The Kazon ship is powering up its engines. It looks like they're getting ready to go to warp. Ready a tractor beam. I've also got two Kazon warships on an intercept course less than 10 minutes away. I love how Tom is like, yeah, I will obey your order, but I feel like your order might change if you heard this one teensy tiny little fact that we're about to be horribly outgunned. <laughs> your call, Captain. Oh crap. First Janeway, then Tom, and now you? Can't you humans solve anything on your own? As a Vulcan, I am at all times honest, Commander. That's not exactly true. You lied to me when you passed yourself off as a Maquis to get on my crew. I was honest to my own convictions within the defined parameters of my mission. What? I know we've seen Vulcans being less than forthright about their ability for deception in the past, but this is just nonsense. Maybe responding with, it was a regrettable part of my mission that I had to employ a certain amount of subterfuge to accomplish it, but I always provided you with honest assessments when you asked for them. Would have made more sense. And Chakotay get upset with the semantics of that response instead of so-called defined parameters. How may I be honest with you today? 
In the light of the current exchange, I think Tuvok just asked Chakotay how he could lie to him. So, state of flux, it's a good episode. I've already said most of my quibbles that I had for this episode. For some reason, Chakotay's relationships never really get much time to grow. They just pop up in the episode they begin, and often end in. While that makes sense for a fling with the guest star of the week, it doesn't make sense for a reoccurring character. This is especially true for Seska. It was known early on that Seska was going to be a spy and eventually betray them. If they wanted the romance plotline, I would have liked to see that reference ahead of time. Though, personally, I think that plotline wasn't needed. Chakotay's lost son wasn't a needed plotline either. Just have Chakotay want to take responsibility for what he viewed as his own failings by bringing Seska on board the ship in the first place. You may have noticed there were a couple of scenes where something feels off in this episode. Like, why is everyone coming to Chakotay, or why isn't Janeway involved? Turns out Kate Mulgrew was sick during recording, so some of her lines were reworked for other characters to say. They did a good job, though. It was only after reading about it that I had an aha moment about a few scenes that I hadn't given much thought to previously. Also, a fun story is that this episode was the second or third episode they recorded with some new costumes, and while they were recording this scene, Chakotay's costume kept ripping from top to bottom. According to the actress that played Seska, she says everyone got to know each other really well after that. I think we got the picture. This is also the last episode that includes Carrie until the very end of Season 7, where he's... well, you'll see when we get there. Carrie made for a good background character, and I'm sad he just faded away after this. And finally, this is the first episode to have a star date after the events of the movie Star Trek Generations, so if you're ever making a timeline, Generation happens between Episodes 10 and 11 of Voyager Season 1. That's it for this video. If you want to be a week ahead of everyone else, you can join my supporters on either Subscribestar or Patreon by searching for Life with Matthew, or just clicking on the links in the description of this video. Thank you to my current supporters, which, according to my notes, are... John DeMarco at the Priority 1 Hail level, Thomas Potts at the Section 31 tier, and at the Hailing Frequencies Open tier are The Salty Trekker, Ben Joaz, Rock Solid Productions, Commodore Ty, Burner Prey 5, and Dr. Alex. Be sure to subscribe for more, and until the next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.